Hello, my name is Chris Hughes and I am the District Deputy Director for the Ohio Department of Transportation District 1. Thank you for taking time to view this presentation about a feasibility study on US 30 and Van Wert and Paulding counties. As part of today's presentation, you will hear from different members of our project team. That includes representatives from the Ohio Department of Transportation District 1, our primary consultant for this feasibility study, Arcadis, as well as our environmental consultant, Lawhon and Associates. This is not the first time that the Ohio Department of Transportation has studied this section of US 30. Past studies were intended as a guide to future development along the corridor and did not contain detailed analysis or design concepts. Past studies did also not include alternatives for an interchange at State Route 49. This current study will contain much more detailed analysis and design concepts for what future access along the corridor might look like, will include several alternatives for an interchange at State Route 49 to be considered and ultimately a preferred alternative will be selected. And while no construction projects are being proposed at this time, the result of this study may include projects that we could seek funding for for future construction. The goal of today's presentation is to introduce this feasibility study, present the purpose and need, gather input from the identified stakeholders, and discuss next steps in the process. The corridor that we are discussing as part of this presentation includes US 30 from the Ohio Indiana state line to just east of the city of Van Wert near the Boroff Road intersection. Because this is such a long segment of US 30, we've split the corridor up into two sections. The western section includes everything from the Indiana Ohio state line to Convoy Road intersection and the eastern section includes the Ritchie Road intersection east to the Boroff Road intersection. A logical dividing point between the two sections is the rest areas on US 30. Here is a map of the western section of the study area, including 12 intersections between the Indiana State Line and Convoy Road. And here is a map of the eastern section of the corridor, including six intersections between Ritchie Road and Boroff Road. So why are we studying this particular segment of US 30? The graph that you see on the screen contains different segments of four lane divided highway located within ODOT District 1. The segments that are identified with brown, with a brown label are segments that are already fully limited access, meaning that access on and off of the four-lane divided highway can only be achieved with ramps at an interchange. The graph shows crash rates in per million vehicle miles traveled. The blue part of the graph is property damage only crashes. The orange is injury crashes, and the red represents fatal crashes. As you can see, our study area on the left part of the screen contains several segments of US 30. Several of these segments have the highest crash rates and highest fatal crash rates of four lane divided highways within ODOT District 1. The green boxes represent segments that already have a safety project underway. So, so several of these segments we are already addressing with current safety projects. Due to the high crash rates and high injury and fatality rates is the reason why we are looking at this corridor at this time. One of the reasons for the high crash rates along this segment that we are studying is the amount of traffic on US 30. The more traffic on US 30, the more difficult it is for vehicles on side roads 
that are either crossing or turning on to US 30 to be able to make that maneuver. As you can see by this graph, traffic on this segment of US 30 has increased dramatically in the last eight years. Currently, we're seeing somewhere between 16 and 18,000 vehicles per day using this segment of US 30. This feasibility study will identify the purpose and need for making any improvements, as well as identify any key issues. It will identify alternatives that can be developed into future projects. And it will be written in a reader-friendly format to provide a record of the public decision. There are two elements to the purpose and need. The first is to improve the overall corridor safety by reducing crashes at high crash locations and by addressing the frequency of wrong way incidents. The second element is to provide a transportation facility that supports economic development sites and the existing agricultural land uses along the corridor. In looking at the safety element of the purpose and need, crash data from 2017 to 2019 was evaluated. There were 236 total crashes in the three-year period. The primary crash types were 37% fixed objects, 17% sideswipe passing, and 13% rear ends. When looking at the severity of the crashes, 61 or 26% of the crashes involved injuries and five fatalities. The US-30 corridor is used by a large percentage of heavy vehicles. Looking at the crash types for these larger vehicles, about 30% involve fixed objects, 30% sideswipe passing, and 8% rear end. There have also been a lot of runway drivers along this corridor, as you can see from this map. The map shows runway driver incidents from January 2016 until February 2021. An incident in this case is when the state patrol was called and notified of a runway driver. The locations on the map show where the driver was traveling when the call was made. This does not mean the driver was stopped by the state patrol, just that someone notified the state patrol about the runway driver incident. As you can see here, east of Boroff Road, where there are no at-grade intersections, there were nine wrongway driver incidents. However, west of Boroff Road, where the at-grade intersections are located, there were 91 wrongway driver incidents. We also compared this corridor to similar corridors in District 1, for example, US 24 in Paulding and Defiance County, and saw that this corridor has many more wrongway driver incidents than others in District 1. This year, ODOT is completing a project to decrease the chances of a wrongway driver on US 30. As you can see from this picture, ODOT has plans to install wrongway arrow pavement markings and additional signage at all the at grade intersections being discussed. Some of the signs in this picture are already out on along the corridor, but there will be additional wrongway signs, one way signs, and stop signs added at all of the intersections. The second element of the purpose and need is to support the existing land uses. This includes the agricultural land uses, which account for the vast majority of the land adjacent to US 30. The study will need to consider the special operating characteristics of the large farm equipment that uses US 30 to access the adjacent fields. The study will also look at drive relocations along the corridor. The purpose and need also includes supporting economic development opportunities. This would include the Vision Industrial Park and the Northwest Ohio Industrial Megasite, located along US 30, north of the city of Van Wert. US 30 needs to provide for both long haul vehicles and local access. A number of the intersections closest to the city of Van Wert are already becoming congested with and will become more so in the near future. 20 years out, majority of the intersections will have some level of increased congestion. This map shows the uh, land uses along the US 30 corridor 
in the vicinity of the city of Van Wert. The gold color are the properties zoned general industrial within the city of Van Wert itself. And the two crosshatch properties are the Vision Industrial Park and the Northwest Ohio Industrial Mega Site. As you can see, there's considerable land that could potentially be developed along the US 30 corridor. So one of the things we wanted to do as we began studying this section of US 30 was to learn where users of the corridor are coming from and where they're going to. And we call that the origin and the destination of each user. Um, the slide that you see shows our portion of US 30 highlighted in yellow in the middle of the screen. And it's on a map that zoomed out so we can see a larger geographic region. You can see Fort Wayne in the top left of the map. And then if you look in the bottom right, you can see um, Lima, Ohio, and I-75. So one of the easiest ways to collect origin and destination data is to use something called Streetlight Data. And Streetlight is an online data source that uses in-vehicle GPS systems and data from cellular telephones to track where a vehicle starts and where they travel to on a given corridor. And so we collected Streetlight Data for our portion of US 30, but we did it um, assuming that people started from outside our corridor and maybe ended up outside of our corridor. So that's why the map is zoomed out to include Fort Wayne and I-75 in kind of a larger geographic region. So there's gonna be a series of maps here um, because we looked at origins and destinations from a number of places. Uh, the first one, the one you see on your screen, shows vehicles coming from Fort Wayne and going to Fort Wayne using US 30. So the way to look at the slide is the green dot is the point of interest. In our case, it's over Fort Wayne. And then the blue dots are where vehicles travel to or where they come from when they're accessing Fort Wayne. And so you can see that most of the vehicles accessing Fort Wayne are going to and from US 127 and 224 or they're going to and from I-75. And we know that because the blue dots are a little bit bigger for those two places. And then we can see a smaller number of vehicles going to and from Fort Wayne are going to US 224 West because the dots a little bit smaller. Then if we move along and we look at I-75, which is kind of the point of interest to the east, you can see that um, most of the vehicles accessing I-75 are going to and from Fort Wayne. That kind of has the biggest blue dot. And then second to that, vehicles are commonly going to US-127, 224 East, and then a slightly smaller number are going to US-224 West. Moving along, if we look at State Route 49 North, we see that vehicles accessing State Route 49 North which is the green dot, are typically coming from Fort Wayne or going to Fort Wayne or US 127, 224 East or um, points east of our study area along US 30 and I-75. And the last two show vehicles accessing 127, 224 East and the next one is gonna be just US 224 West. Um, and we see that most of those users are coming to or going, coming from or going to Fort Wayne or I-75 with a slightly smaller number as accessing um, State Route 49 North. And then if we look at US 224 West, it's very similar. Um, most people are coming from or going to Fort Wayne or I-75 with a slightly smaller number going to State Route 49 North. And so the origin destination analysis kind of confirms what we thought we already knew, and that, that is that Fort Wayne and I-75 are the most popular origins and destinations for users on our section of US-30. Um, it also taught us that US-127 and 224 are kind of the second most popular destination, and then State Route 49 North is probably the third tier um, origin destination along the corridor, which kind of confirms what we thought we knew, but it's nice to have the data to back up that that is where a majority of users of US 30 are either going to or coming from. 
The other thing we wanted to do as we began studying this section of US 30 was to learn how well each intersection handles the traffic that uses it. And we do that by performing something called a capacity analysis. Before I go into this slide, I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And there are a few pieces to a capacity analysis. The first thing we need is traffic volumes because we need to know how many vehicles use, use each intersection and whether each vehicle is making a left turn, a through movement, or a right turn. So to do that, we set up cameras at each intersection and we basically count the cars that use the intersection over a period of several days. And that tells us the number of vehicles commonly using each intersection. The second thing we wanna know is how many cars might use US 30 and each intersection along it now and in the future, because we want to make sure that the corridor operates well now and for years to come. So to do that, we review some economic development plans and we look at regional population trends and we try to determine how many more cars may use US 30 about five years from now and about 25 years from now. Then the third thing we know is that intersections are often the busiest in the morning and in the evening. So when we perform a capacity analysis, we do it for the morning peak hour and for the evening peak hour. So the gist of this is that a capacity analysis, to do it, we collect traffic data, we forecast it or grow the traffic data um, based on population trends to develop volumes five years from now and about 25 years from now into the future. And then we determine how many cars will use each intersection during the morning peak hour and during the evening peak hour. And we plug those volumes into a piece of computer software and that provides us results called level of service. So the results of a capacity analysis are level of service. Level of service measures the delay each vehicle experiences a stop sign or a traffic signal. And that's basically how long you're stopped at a stop sign or traffic signal before you can proceed through it. And the amount of delay predicted by a capacity analysis corresponds to a letter. And so that's the letters you see on the slide here, um, A through F. A is the best, F is the worst. In Ohio, we generally consider A through D acceptable because that means a user will experience less than one minute of delay at a signal and less than half a minute of delay at a stop sign. And level of service E and F are delay more than that and so we generally try to avoid that level of service in Ohio. So the slide you're viewing shows the results of the capacity analysis for each intersection in the western section of US 30. And there's going to be a series of these slides. To look at them, the first thing you want to do is look at the top of each slide and check the year. You can see this one is intersections on the west end of the corridor in 2027. And that's the threshold we picked for the about five years from now capacity analysis. And so this slide presents the level of service about five years from now for these intersections. And then you wanna look at the colorful boxes in the middle of the screen, and that shows the results of the capacity analysis for each approach, for each intersection. So just as, as an example, if we look at State Route 49, you can see that on the southbound approach, which is the north leg of State Route 49, the level of service in the morning is C with 23 seconds of delay and F with about 54 seconds of delay. And so what that means is that a car traveling southbound on State Route 49 that approaches the stop sign at US 30 is predicted to experience about 25 seconds of delay in the morning, and they're gonna experience about a minute or a little bit more than a minute of delay in the evening as they wait to either cross US 30 or make a left or a right turn movement onto US 30. Then similarly, the northbound approach, which is really Payne Road, the level of service in the morning is B with 14 seconds of delay. And in the evening peak hour, it's C with 21 seconds of delay. And so that means that if you're traveling northbound on Payne Road and you come up to the stop sign at US 30, if you're Doing that in the morning peak hour, you're gonna experience about 15 seconds of delay. That's level service B. And then if you do it in the evening, you're gonna experience about 25 seconds of delay, which is level service C. And so as you look across the colorful boxes of each one, you can kind of see that in five years from now, 
This is about the level of service we expect at each intersection on the western section of the corridor. And the level of services look pretty good. You can see that Feesby Wisner, um, the north leg or the southbound approach is level service E in the evening peak hour. Um, that's getting a little bit lengthy. Um, then you can see similarly Convoy Road, the north leg, and State Line Road, the north leg, in the evening peak hour are level service D. So you can see that most intersections are going to operate well. Um, a couple outliers here and there, but that's kind of the snapshot of traffic, traffic operations at these intersections in 2027. Then it, similarly, if we look at 2047, you start with the top box, you see these are still the intersections to the west in 2047, which is the threshold we selected for the about 25 years from now analysis. And then you look at the colorful boxes, you can see that um, as traffic volumes grow and population in the area may grow, there's going to be more users on US 30. And so it starts to produce more delay at each of the intersections. Um, and we'll go through the same example. If we look at State Route 49, you can see um, the southbound approach or the north leg in the AM peak hour, the level service is E. In the PM, it's level service F. And then similarly, if you look at Payne Road, which is the northbound approach or the south leg, level service is C in the morning and level service is D with 34 seconds of delay in the evening. And so that tells us that as population trends grow, the delay at these intersections might get a little bit worse. And during the um, AM peak hour on State Route 49, a user might experience about a minute of delay in the morning and maybe upwards of three minutes of delay in the afternoon. And then on Payne Road, uh, the level service is a little bit better, but in the morning, a user might see about 20 seconds of delay, and in the evening, it's about 34 seconds of delay, which is the level service D that you see there. Then when we move on to the intersections on the east end of the corridor, it's still the same type of figure. Um, if you want to start, you look at the top, you see that it's intersections along the east uh, in the year 2027. And then we'll go through a similar example. If we look at Liberty Union Road, we can see that um, in 2027, both the north and the south legs are level service D, and the delay is going to range between 20 and 30 seconds, um, which is how long you'll wait at that stop sign if you are trying to access US 30. And then if we go to 2047, you can see we're still on intersections to the east. The year is 2047, so about 25 years from now. And you can see similar to the State Route 49 example, the level of service and delay at Liberty Union Road is going to get a little bit worse as population grows in the area and users of US 30 might increase over the next 25 years. And so um, if you're on Liberty Union Road traveling southbound, which is the north leg, and you approach the stop sign at US 30 in the morning peak hour, um, you might experience about 26 seconds delay. Uh, if you do it in the evening peak hour, it's getting around 40 seconds of delay. And then it's real similar numbers if you're on Liberty Union Road traveling northbound, which is the south leg. If you approach that stop sign in the morning peak hour, the level of service is about 31 seconds, and the level of service in the evening peak hour is um, e, which is about 41 seconds. And so we do this exercise to kind of learn how does the corridor operate now? How well do the intersections serve the traffic that want to use them? And then as we move forward and start to talk about how we want to implement improvements, we use the same type of capacity analysis to analyze how well a different intersection configuration might handle traffic uh, in 2027 and in 2047. And I'll turn it back over to Craig. The data gathered during this study will be used to develop design concepts. Expect this study to develop multiple solutions or alternatives that could be advanced into designs as separate projects. There are a number of options for reconfiguring intersections. One is to leave the existing at grade intersection as is. Another is to create a cul-de-sac in which the crossroad is disconnected from US 30 and a turnaround is provided. Or an overpass can be created in which the crossroad 
as continuous over US-30, but no connection to US-30 is provided. A right-in, right-out intersection allows traffic to turn right into or out of the crossroad. However, crossroad traffic across US-30 is not provided for, nor are left turns in or out of the intersection. There is also interchanges. The one pictured is the US-224 interchange with US-30. Another alternative is the R-cut or restricted crossing U-turn. This is very similar to the right in, right out intersection, except that the movements across US-30 and the left turns into and out of the crossroad are provided via U-turns upstream and downstream of the intersection. Here are the next steps for the study. We will be collecting comments until September 3rd, 2021, at which point we will review the comments and other information and use these to develop preliminary alternatives. In December of 2021, we will present these developed alternatives back to the stakeholders in a second stakeholder meeting. In early 2022, we will select preferred alternatives and present these to the public in a public meeting. Then finally, in summer 2022, we will finalize the feasibility study. Today we are asking for input from you. If there are any other needs that need to be investigated or safety concerns that we did not identify that need to be included in the study, please let us know. If you have any other general questions about this corridor for the project team, also include those in the comments. To submit comments after the meeting, you can use the ODOT project website linked on this slide or call Kylie at 419-999-6885. You can also email or mail a comment form or letter to the addresses shown on the slide. All comments carry equal weight no matter how they are submitted. Please provide your comments by September 3rd, 2021.